Concerning the Spiritual in Art by Vasily Kandinsky, translated by Michael T. H. Sadler, Chapter 1. Every work of art is the child of its age, and in many cases the mother of our emotions. It follows that each period of culture produces an art of its own which can never be repeated. Efforts to revive the art principles of the past will at best produce an art that is still born. It is impossible for us to live and feel as did the ancient Greeks. In the same way, those who strive to follow the Greek methods in sculpture achieve only a similarity of form, the work remaining soulless for all time. Such imitation is mere aping. Externally, the monkey completely resembles a human being. He will sit holding a book in front of his nose and turn over the pages with a thoughtful aspect, but his actions have for him no real meaning. There is, however, in art another kind of external similarity which is founded on a fundamental truth. When there is a similarity of inner tendency in the whole moral and spiritual atmosphere, a similarity of ideals at first closely pursued but later lost to thought, a similarity in the inner feeling of any one period to that of another, the logical result will be a revival of the external forms which served to express those inner feelings in an earlier age. An example of this today is our sympathy, our spiritual relationship with the primitives. Like ourselves, these artists sought to express in their work only internal truths, renouncing in consequence all consideration of external form. This all-important spark of inner life today is at present only a spark. Our minds, which are even now only just awakening after years of materialism, are infected with the despair of unbelief, of lack of purpose and ideal. The nightmare of materialism, which has turned the life of the universe into an evil, useless game, is not yet past. It holds the awakening soul still in its grip. Only a feeble light glimmers like a tiny star in a vast gulf of darkness. This feeble light is but a presentiment and the soul when it sees it trembles in doubt whether the light is not a dream and the gulf of darkness reality this doubt and the still harsh tyranny of the materialistic philosophy divide our souls sharply from that of the primitives our soul rings cracked when we seek to play upon it as does a costly vase long buried in the earth which is found to have a flaw when it is dug up once more for this reason the primitive phase through which we are now passing with its temporary similarity of form can only be of short duration these two possible resemblances between the art forms of today and those of the past will be at once recognized as diametrically opposed to one another the first being purely external has no future the second being internal contains the seed of the future within itself after the period of materialist effort which held this soul in check until it was shaken off as evil the soul is emerging purged by trials and sufferings shapeless emotions such as fear joy grief etc which belong to this time of effort will no longer greatly attract the artist he will endeavour to awake subtler emotions as yet unnamed living himself a complicated and comparatively subtle life his work will give to those observers capable of feeling them lofty emotions beyond the reach of words the observer of today however is seldom capable of feeling such emotions he seeks in a work of art a mere imitation of nature which can serve some definite purpose for example a portrait in the ordinary sense or a presentment of nature according to a certain convention impressionist painting or some inner feeling expressed in terms of natural form as we say a picture with stimmung all those varieties of picture when they are really art fulfil their purpose and feed the spirit though this applies to the first case it applies more strongly to the third where the spectator does feel a corresponding thrill in himself such harmony or even contrast of emotion cannot be superficial or worthless indeed the stimmung of a picture can deepen and purify that of the spectator such works of art at least preserve the soul from coarseness they key it up so to speak to a certain height as a tuning key the strings of a musical instrument but purification and extension and duration and size of this sympathy of soul remain one-sided 
and the possibilities of the influence of art are not exerted to their utmost imagine a building divided into many rooms the building may be large or small every wall of every room is covered with pictures of various sizes perhaps they number many thousands they represent in color bits of nature animals in sunlight or shadow drinking standing in water lying on the grass near to a crucifixion by a painter who does not believe in christ flowers human figures sitting standing walking often they are naked many naked women seen foreshortened from behind apples and silver dishes portrait of counsellor so-and-so sunset lady in red flying duck portrait of lady x flying geese lady in white calves in shadow flecked with brilliant yellow sunlight portrait of prince y lady in green all this is carefully printed in a book name of artist name of picture people with these books in their hands go from wall to wall turning over pages reading the names then they go away neither richer nor poorer than when they came and are absorbed at once in their business which has nothing to do with art why did they come in each picture is a whole lifetime imprisoned a whole lifetime of fears doubts hopes and joys whither is this lifetime tending what is the message of the competent artist to send light into the darkness of men's hearts such is the duty of the artist said schumann an artist is a man who can draw and paint everything said tolstoy of these two definitions of the artist's activity we must choose the second if we think of the exhibition just described on one canvas is a huddle of objects painted with varying degrees of skill virtuosity and vigour harshly or smoothly to harmonise the whole is the task of art with cold eyes and indifferent mind the spectators regard the work connoisseurs admire the skill as one admires a tightrope walker enjoy the quality of painting as one enjoys a pasty but hungry souls go hungry away the vulgar herd stroll through the rooms and pronounce the pictures nice or splendid those who could speak have said nothing those who could hear have heard nothing this condition of art is called art for art's sake this neglect of inner meanings which is the life of colours this vain squandering of artistic power is called art for art's sake the artist seeks for material reward for his dexterity his power of vision and experience his purpose becomes the satisfaction of vanity and greed in place of the steady cooperation of artists is a scramble for good things there are complaints of excessive competition of overproduction hatred partisanship cliques jealousy intrigues are the natural consequences of this aimless materialist art the onlooker turns away from the artist who has higher ideals and who cannot see his life purpose in an art without aims sympathy is the education of the spectator from the point of view of the artist it has been said above that art is the child of its age such an art can only create an artistic feeling which is already clearly felt this art which has no power for the future which is only a child of the age and cannot become a mother of the future is a barren art she is transitory and to all intent dies the moment the atmosphere alters which nourished her the other art that which is capable of educating further springs equally from contemporary feeling but is at the same time not only echo and mirror of it but also has a deep and powerful prophetic strength the spiritual life to which art belongs and of which she is one of the mightiest elements is a complicated but definite and easily definable movement forwards and upwards this movement is the movement of experience it may take different forms but it holds at bottom to the same inner thought and purpose veiled in obscurity are the causes of this need to move ever upwards and forwards by sweat of the brow through sufferings and fears when one stage has been accomplished and many evil stones cleared from the road some unseen and wicked hand scatters new obstacles in the way so that the path often seems blocked and totally obliterated but there never fails to come to the rescue some human being like ourselves in everything except that he has in him a secret power of vision he sees and points the way the power to do this he would sometimes fain lay aside for it is a bitter cross to bear but he cannot do so scorned and hated he drags after him over the stones the heavy chariot of a divided humanity ever forwards and upwards 
Often, many years after his body has vanished from the earth, men try by every means to recreate this body in marble, iron, bronze, or stone, on an enormous scale, as if there were any intrinsic value in the bodily existence of such divine martyrs and servants of humanity, who despised the flesh and lived only for the spirit. But at least such setting up of marble is a proof that a great number of men have reached the point where once the being they would know part one about general aesthetic chapter one introduction of concerning the spiritual in art by vasily kandinsky this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. 